right. Something. I'll assume that's pointing in the right direction. Um, excellent. So welcome, everyone. Um, so introduction. So for those that are here for the first time, my name is Jed Taylor. Uh, I'm the director of the Technology Entrepreneur Center up in the uh, College of Engineering. And I work down as one of the entrepreneurs in residence down here at Research Park as well. And this is our uh, second of our three workshop series for SBIR commercialization. Now, let me tell you, we were planning on having Jesus Soriano here today uh, from SBIR uh, program director and also the RTT program. So as of last night, late last night, he had a family emergency and he had to cancel late last night. And so he will not be here today. We're going to reschedule that in the next week or so. So he was uh, uh, deeply disappointed that he couldn't be here today. Okay. So he'll, uh, rather than cancel, we're just going to go uh, forward today and uh, talk about commercialization plans and the uh, SBIR review process. And then we'll, uh, we'll reschedule and have Jesus here in the next uh, week or so. Okay. So uh, is what we'll talk about today is we'll talk about uh, commercialization plans. And then I'll also mention one other thing when Jesus comes, he's going to talk about a new solicitation that's out as well for, uh, uh, called the RTT program that he runs. And uh, when, we, when we send out the, uh, we, we, we'll have all your emails and I'll point you to that as well. Uh, the new RTT program he's running is uh, for people that are at the university. Uh, think of it as, the way he explained it to me is, he said, think about it as SBIR grants within the university. Okay? So you don't necessarily have to have a, a startup company. So if, as you know, as SBIRs are, are for companies, the RTT program is SBIR-like, but you do it within the university. Okay? So he just put out the new solicitation, and it's online. He sent me the numbers uh, for it. And you can see that, uh, uh, you can see the solicitation, it's due in January, and then the, the second one is due in July. So he'll be talking about that when he comes uh, and, and presents uh, in the next couple of weeks. So uh, we'll send, I'll send that link out to everybody that's here, and then, uh, you can, then you can come and ask him questions when he presents here, okay? So again, today we'll talk about, uh, we'll, we'll talk about commercialization plans, and then I will also spend probably 20 minutes or so talking about what an SBIR plan or SBIR, SBIR review process looks like, and then I'll answer any questions about it. And then we'll, we'll go from there. And then the next, uh, uh, the third, pro the third uh, uh, workshop that we have set up uh, is we'll have Roland Garten talk about uh, technical review plans as well and some budgets as well. Yeah, it's called budget, but it covers a lot more than budgets. Yeah. Elements of a strong proposal, lots of administrative details, boring as hell, but these are little <laughs> things that you have to deal with in order to make sure that you get considered. Yes. Boring, but necessary. Yeah. Very yeah. necessary. And so I'm glad Roland's here because Roland is a, a key part of our uh, SBIR team here at, at Enterprise Works. So, so if you have any questions, uh, uh, feel free to reach out to Roland and uh, we'll go from there. So, uh, any other questions that you'd like to try, like us to try and uh, address during this, uh, during today's workshop? No. Uh, so, for those I, I have a question. Yes. I have a question, Jen. So, it, um, I know Jesus isn't there, but are you going to talk a little bit about NSF versus NIH when it comes to this SBIR process? Or good, is that for another day? Good, good question. So, uh, and I mentioned this the last time. So. Is what we try to do is uh, we try to talk generally about SBIR programs because they're all slightly different. Uh, we definitely have a slant towards NSF. So uh, if you have specific questions about NIH, we do have an NIH expert that can, we can point you towards. But uh, we'll try to talk generally about SBIR, but with a definitely more of a slant towards NSF. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. Is that the next deadline coming up? Yeah. Okay. And, and so, for those that just entered, uh, Jesus will not be here today. Jesus had a family emergency, and so he'll not be coming in or speaking today. And we'll be following up with him in the next week or so, and he'll come back and give a talk. Okay, so with that, uh, let me tell you a little bit about what I'll be talking about, uh, what, what I have my slides put together for. Uh, I'll talk about the objectives of the SBIR process. Uh, I'll skip over the part about the panel review process, and I'll talk about that towards the end. 
And then uh, I'll talk about the commercialization plan, because that's the focus of today. So I'll talk about the sections of a commercialization plan on a phase one proposal. I always think about a phase one proposal, uh, or the phase two commercialization plan, as just a really blown out uh, commercialization plan of a phase one. Okay? And then I'll talk about uh, a lot of the pitfalls that we see in uh, SBIR proposals. And then I'll talk about optics of, a faith of, of an SBIR proposal, because I often get, what, is a faith, what does an SBIR proposal look like? And so I put in a couple of shots from a phase, uh, or from an SBIR proposal, so you know what one looks like. And then uh, I'll talk at, at the end, I'll, I'll spend a lot more time talking about the panel review uh, uh, process of what it looks like. Uh, kind of the thought process that I always, it seems that they're always uh, like on a, on a panel review. So if you say the phase one is a blown up reversion of phase two. No, uh, the flip side. The, the flip phase side. two commercialization plan is just a blown out phase one. Well, that means you should be looking at phase two when you're doing phase one. I actually do think about that. that when I, I think it's important that when you're putting together a, a phase one, you think about a phase two as well. Yeah. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that uh, as we get in there. Okay. So, so if you think about it, a phase one proposal is uh, 15 pages, okay? and, and I actually have it detailed out here about the, what each section, uh, how many pages each section is, but in general, a phase one proposal is 15 pages, okay? and then there's some supplementary documents that go on there, but the, the actual proposal is 15 pages. When you're putting together a phase two, the commercialization plan alone is 15 pages. And, and in the phase one, the commercialization section is about half of that 15 pages. Okay? So the phase two commercialization plan itself is 15 pages, and it goes in much you know, more in depth in each one of those sections of the phase one. Okay? So we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, as we get into it. So a little bit about myself. So my background is, like I mentioned, I'm the director of the Technology Entrepreneur Center in the college. Uh, I'm one of the entrepreneurs in residence here at Enterprise Works. Before that, uh, my background was computer science, uh, and then uh, I did an MBA here at Illinois, and then I worked at Honeywell. And then after that, I actually came back and did a startup company with my advisor from uh, from the computer science department here. And we actually did a we launched a company here out of Enterprise Works. And while we were here, we actually launched using the SBIR program. And we went through and we leveraged all of the SBIR opportunities. We did phase one. At the time, there was a phase 1B, which was a matching opportunity, and that's disappeared now. I'm not, I, I do not believe there's a phase 1B anymore. Is that, is that correct, Roland? Um, I think there still is, or there was last year, but... Yeah, I think it's... I, I, I think it just went away. Yeah, I think it went away. Okay. And, and then, then now there's, the phase, there's, there's a phase 2, and there's a phase 2B, which is a matching, which we, we can talk a little bit about later. And then within a phase two, there's all kinds of opportunities for matching or for, for supplemental funds as well. That you can get, uh, uh, when it's all said and done, from a phase one to the end of the phase two process, there's upwards of a million and a half dollars that you can get from the NSF. Now, the other institute or institutions like the NIH, there's opportunities for uh, uh, more money. Uh, uh, for, a, for an NIH, you can go straight to a phase two and they're. There are a lot more, but uh, with, with the NSF in general, you can get about hundred or $1.5 million from, uh, without giving up any equity. But uh, in, in general, with the NSF, uh, the company that I was with, we, uh, we were able to leverage all of those opportunities. And I ended up speaking, I've spoken at the NSF Grantees Conference, and then I, I've, uh, I review several times a year uh, with the NSF. And then through that, I was able to get involved with the i program, for those that are familiar with that. And I, I, regular, I, I run the i programs here and throughout the Midwest. Okay, so as I mentioned, here's the breakdown of what a phase one proposal looks like at the NSF. And the other ones are a little bit different, but they're... They, they should, Jed, yes. Jed, I'm so sorry. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but we can only see, like on this slide, half of the commercial opportunity and then the next three. Well, it's not a lie. It sort of set off to the left of me and half a slide. Uh, as a guest, I can see the entire slide, as can the other guests. So I don't know if yeah, it's a screen on the screen. We're both looking at different computers and seeing the same thing. Uh, I'm not sure what's. Uh, you know what, Catherine? Maybe you can send him a copy of the slides. Can you get him a. That'd be helpful. Yeah. Yes. Catherine will send you a copy of the slides. Okay, great. Uh, okay. So the breakdown, here's a breakdown of a phase one, okay? So in a phase one, 
you start off with, you have an elevator pitch slide, which is just like you would, or, or an elevator pitch page, which is just giving an overview of your uh, uh, technology. And I always remember, to try to think about it like this, the people that are reviewing your proposals uh, have a lot of things to review, right? Uh, typically when you're reviewing, you get, uh, um, in a phase one, a reviewer will have maybe 10 proposals to review, sometimes more, but usually around 10 proposals, and they're each 10 or 15 pages with a lot of supplemental material. So a phase one, when it's all said and done, can be upwards of 40 to 50 pages, and they have 10 of those, right? That's, with all, that's the 15 pages with all the supplemental materials, okay? So I always think about, you want to make sure that your, your elevator pitch is compelling to read. You do not want to put the reviewers to sleep, okay? So don't think of this as like an academic research paper, right? So just keep that in mind as you're putting together your elevator pitch. After the, the one page, you've got the commercial opportunity. So this is where you want to engage the person and make them understand that this is a compelling opportunity, right? So there, I want to try to get across that. I'll talk about this a little bit more in the next couple of slides, but you know, the commercial opportunity, just think about it being two to four pages <clears throat> of making the person understand that this is a big opportunity. Okay? From there, you talk about the innovation, and this is where you'll talk about the, the technology, uh, what goes into it. Uh, then you talk about the company and team. We'll talk about all these sections a little bit later. And then you have the technology uh, discussion in the R&D plan. And pretty straightforward. Okay. We'll, uh, I'll, I'll talk about this again at the end, but uh, the typical panel uh, makeup is you've got commercial reviewers and you have uh, technical reviewers as well. So the commercial reviewers, I am always a commercial reviewer, okay? And I think that's important to think about because the, I put a picture over here of what the, what the review uh, room always looks like. Every time I've been in one, and I've been on different uh, panels with different program directors, but there's always uh, uh, about four or five chairs on one side of the table, four or five chairs on the other side. And they always have the technical reviewer sit on one side, the commercial reviewer sit on the other. And I am a technical person, but I usually don't have a background in the panels that I sit on. And they always say the commercial reviewers can be technology agnostic. Okay? So they'll have people like me review the commercial opportunity or commercial potential of these innovations. Okay? And then they will have people, they will try to group the, the proposals in the, air, in, in the very specific areas, and then they will try to get people that have a background in your area be the technical reviewers. Okay? So that's typically what, uh, how, how the panel will be made up. And then they will uh, they'll, you know, they'll, they'll get about 10 or 15 proposals in that specific area, and then that will be your, uh, your panel. Overall, a phase one will have about uh, 10 to 12 proposals in a panel. And then a phase two will have four to six. That's every, every panel I've been on has been very similar to that. Okay? And then usually, as like I mentioned, usually you'll get the proposals about two weeks before and then you'll have to read them. So as I said, keep that in mind as you're putting your proposals together that you want them to make sure that they're compelling and they're not uh, you know, awful to read and bore. Okay? Now, something else that I think is really important to understand is I've heard this from several of the program directors that they will read every one of your proposals, okay? And they'll read them several times. I think that's important, to, important to, to understand. I remember one of the program directors telling me that he said, if somebody takes the, takes the time to put together a proposal, he owes it to him to read it thoroughly and make sure he really understands the proposal, okay? So don't think that if you put something, it's not you put something together, it's not going to get read. It'll, they put a lot of time and effort into reading it. Okay. So, any question about that? So we'll talk a little bit more about uh, some thoughts on the review panel. Yeah. You know how many um, proposals they receive each cycle compared to other NSF proposals? They read. They get hundreds of them, and some of them get more than others. So when Jesus comes on next, next, you know, the next week or two, he'll tell you. He used to be over the Smart Health. Like Smart Health, for instance, would get far more than any other group, and it used to overflow into the others. He used to have to give some some proposals to the other groups. Okay. Uh, the only thing that I the only thing I remember for sure is that like if if the, the difference between like SPIR and STTR. That used to have an impact because they used to not get a lot of STTRs, and there's a, there's less money, but they used to not get as many. So your, your chances, like with an STTR, might be improved. Uh, but they get they get hundreds and hundreds of proposals. Okay. okay. 
So let me talk about some of my, my goals in writing proposals when I, when I write these. Keep in mind that a phase one is a feasibility study. Okay? So the idea behind it, this is really important to think about, is it's a feasibility study. So you're trying to make sure, you're trying to prove out a concept okay, in a phase one. So uh, I'll, I'll try to think about, like as I'm putting it together, is what concepts can, or what uh, technical objectives can I put together in my proposal that when I'm done with it, I can show that it's a feasible, like it's, that, that, there's a, that I've proved it out that I can take the next step, right? It's a feasibility study. I'm trying to prove out this concept that it works, okay? So you just gotta keep that in mind when you're trying to choose your technical objectives that you wanna prove out, okay? You're trying to show that you're reducing technical risk during your phase one, okay? Now I think when we talked last week, or a couple weeks ago in the, in the first workshop we did, Somebody asked, like, if I already had something in a lab, am I too far along? And it's absolutely not. If, uh, if somebody's in that situation, you can always show that you have a lab prototype, you know, something in the lab already, but that's just a prototype. And now in your phase one, you're trying to show that it's actually, uh, uh, you can try to show something else, but you can say you've got a lab prototype, and you're trying to take the next step, right, and prove that it works in a different environment. There's things you can do like that. You just got to keep in mind that phase one is a feasibility study. Okay. The second thing I put here is appearance that it's a phase two company. Okay. So this kind of goes to the question you were asking earlier, thinking about a phase two. So I've had several times a program director has talked about that they get judged based on, or I'm not sure this is still the same metric, but they, they get judged by the, the success of the company or the success of the program is how many phase two companies do they create? Phase 2B companies. Now let me tell, talk to you about a Phase 2B company. Phase two, phase 2 is where we're trying to get to, right? That's where you, you, uh, you get the Phase 2 grant, which now is a $750,000 grant at NSF. Now a Phase 2B company is when you get an outside uh, company that puts in money as well, okay? and you get matching dollars. Okay? That means some outside entity has actually put money into your company as well. So if you can, if, if I always try to think about, as I'm writing a proposal, I want to give the impression that we're going to be a successful phase 2B company at some point, okay? So that's what we want to, want to think about as I'm putting a proposal together, is that, that we're going to be a successful phase 2B company at some point. So that's an important thing to, to think about as you're, as you're putting your plan together as well, is that you're going to be able to one day be a successful phase 2B company, okay? Yes? Um, is it an issue if you already have a significant investment into the company before you like, apply for phase one? Uh, it depends. The answer is it depends. Is, is it going to uh, disqualify you? Absolutely not. But it, it depends on the particular uh, uh, situation. So the, my experience has been the program directors understand that it takes significant investment for a lot of companies to get started. Uh, the company I was involved with, we had uh, several million dollars of investment before we actually uh, got our phase two. Okay. So uh, talk to one of us before uh, and, and help you craft that. But okay. I've also been on a panel discussion or a panel before where a company had a lot of investment and they did they didn't make the case for why they needed NSF to invest as well. So it just depends. Okay. But it, but an investment into your into your company certainly does not disqualify you. From yeah. So that last piece that you said, so if there is a company, if it seems like the company is already being well funded, then the NSF would not be interested in helping fund this company. No, that's not that's not true. You have to make a case for why the NSF should invest in it. Okay. Right? So, but, but an outside investment certainly does not disqualify you because there's a, the, a lot of the things that we work on at universities that, that take a lot of investment. But you certainly have to make a case for the, the NSF to, to need to invest in you. But could the case simply be just the reputation that comes along with being part of the NSF you know, process? Why would, so I, if I was on a panel, I would say, why does that matter to the NSF? So you have to make a stronger case for why the NSF would need to invest in you. And the NSF likes to invest in high-risk ventures that other people um, that other people will not bet, invest in. But just if you've got a lot of investment, uh, NSF will still invest in you. You just have to make a case for why, why they need to. Uh, so I've seen, I've seen uh, a, a really good case is we've got investment money, but our investors 
require a certain low level of risk. They will not accept an initiative that's a high risk effort. This is a high risk effort, therefore it's outside the scope of our investors, so we need NSF to de-risk it so that it becomes investable. And if you get a letter from an investor saying that, it's even stronger. The mm -hmm. letter says, we are a, a low risk company, we invest in this, this is a promising effort, but we can't invest in it because it's too high risk right now. That's a very good case. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Yeah. Can that investment be used as part of the match for the phase two B? Yes, uh, not if it's before they get a phase one. So uh, you can it, you can start collecting or start accumulating money for a phase to be after you receive a phase one. Okay. Okay. So general approach. This kind of goes to what we were just talking about. Is, is the type of stuff we've done is uh, I, well. Let me, let me just address them here as I've got. It. So my general approach in writing an SBIR is write it in a way that a technical person can understand what you're talking about, okay? And it goes back to the point what I was talking about of what a panel, does, what a panel typically looks like. It's, it has several people like myself on it that are technical people that may not be in the field that you're in, okay? So if you write it in a way that someone like me cannot understand what you're doing, then you're hurting yourself, okay? So write it in a way that a technical person that's not in your field can understand. Now, there's always going to be some things that I may not understand because I'm not in your field, but your whole proposal shouldn't be like that. Okay? So you want to keep that in mind. High risk. They are, uh, the, this, this goes on to just like what Roland was talking about. They will fund high risk things. They want to, they want to fund high risk things. I was just talking, uh, last time we did this, our last workshop, I mentioned the example of the company that was actually in this building, uh, that's still in this building, that uh, put together a proposal a few years ago and applied and they did not get funded because they made it appear that they were not a high risk investment. They actually proposed two ways to go to market and they were rejected in their phase one because they, <coughs> the feedback was that is not risky enough. Okay? And they were told to either choose one way or the other and they would get funded. And they did that and six months later and they actually were funded the next time around. Okay? So they're not venture capitalists. They are not, because typically when you pitch, uh, pitch to a venture capitalist, they want to see that you've eliminated some of the risk, but that's not what the NSF's doing. They're looking for high risk investments, okay? That actually move the, move the needle, okay? Now, I think the other, one of the other key things I put in here is uh, think about i okay? Think about the i program. They've, they've invested a lot of money in the i program, and what does the i program teach us? Teaches customer discovery. That's an important part of the NSF program nowadays, is customer discovery. There's nothing magical about the i program. Okay? There's nothing magic about the word i uh, In fact, I don't, I, I, my experience has been on the SBIR program panels, they don't care about the word i -Corps. They care about customer discovery. Okay? If you went out there and validated who your customers are, okay? I can tell you one of the best SBIR proposals I've ever read actually had never been through the i program, but they had been through a lean startup program where they actually went out and validated their customers. Okay? So that's so important to do, to be able to validate your customers. So if anything you can do to show that you've actually validated customers will help you out immensely. Now the reason it's important is because it helps show that once you've been successful in de-risking your technology, you're actually going to have customers lined up to buy your products. And as an, as, uh, since the NSF is an investor, or your, you know, whichever agency you're working with is an is a investor in your company, it gives them more confidence in uh, you know, putting money behind your venture. Okay? Now, we have i programs all around. We have you know, plenty of them here in Illinois and all around the Midwest. It's just an excellent opportunity for you to participate in our i programs. So just the easiest way to do it is just participate. Uh, don't hide your gaps. I think this is another key thing when you're, when you're writing an SBIR, is if you've got a gap, especially in your team, don't hide your gaps. Your program, your, your NSF reviewers or SBIR reviewers, they can see the gaps that you have. They see, you know, they review hundreds and hundreds of these proposals every year. They're going to see any gaps you have, so don't, don't hide them. I, think, I, I find that it's much better to just call out your gaps and just acknowledge how you're going to address them. Okay? So, Specifically on your teams, most of our teams, uh, especially on a phase one, are going to have gaps in your team. Okay? 
So just put a plan in place to address the gaps. Okay. So I mentioned in our, in our uh, roadmap uh, discussion a couple of weeks ago, is start now on putting together a plan for uh, filling out your board of advisors and your, uh, your people to help you in your teams. Okay? And, and just don't hide it because uh, that'll, hurt, that'll hurt you far worse if you just have go gaping holes and you just pretend like you don't have them. Okay. So yeah. I understand the video, but can you give me more of an example? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like if you have nobody to help you on the business side, right? And you, you think that you do, but you really don't. And you don't acknowledge that, right? If you're a team of scientists, and you have no business expertise, and you don't mention that anywhere in your proposal. That's an obvious place, okay? Uh, or if you have nobody helping you with uh, customer discovery or sales, or, or let's, say it's, let's say it's the other way around. Let's say you're a team of business people, and you have nobody helping you on the science side or the research side, because these are research proposals, right? There's a lot of technical work that needs to be done. If you're a team of MBA students, and you have no one helping you on the R&D side. That'd be another gap. Okay. Yes. Sorry, this is like kind of really specific, but what if, what if we have a very large company that has all of that that's looking to invest in our company, mm -hmm. but we need to go a little bit further to get to be less risky, but they could fill our gaps. Mm -hmm. Can we talk about that in the application, or does it look like? We do, don't need the money. Do you have a letter of support? We could get. We could definitely get. Yeah. Letters. No. No. I. Don't, I don't think that would be okay. It's all in the details, right? It's all in the details. But I think nothing that you said there would be something that would stop you from getting an SBIR. Okay. Okay. That's what I would say. But it's all in the details, right? There's lots of people that say things like that. So it's all in the details. Uh, if, if I was a reviewer, it, I would want to see the details behind that. What commitment are they making? I would certainly, and, and not even as a reviewer, but as an entrepreneur in residence, I would want to see what details have been worked out, what are they what are they actually committing? Because lots of people say they have deals like that and they never get done. Right? I mean everybody talks about like most companies here talk about those type of deals that never happen. Okay? So I would want to see what type of commitments have they made and work out type of specifics. Okay? Because if I if I heard you talk about that, I'd go, sure you do. Right? So I wouldn't think you had it done, to be honest with you, unless they actually can. Yes. I'm so sorry. I have a question. Uh -huh. It's really, I think it's related, although I didn't hear all of this question. So if we have a technology that's actually a compilation of we're embedding somebody's API into our technology, uh -huh. does that is it considered unique enough to be something that we could apply towards? It, that, that's that would be asked that question. Yeah. So it's so. A partnership. Yeah, so there's nothing, I don't think there's anything that you said there that uh, would be disqualifying. It would all be in the details again. It would be, you, you would have to really explain what your innovation is and what's unique about what you're doing. Okay? So if, if, if you're just simply taking something that's not very unique and applying somebody else's work into yours, uh, and there's not much true IP in what you're doing, then that can be a problem. Okay? Uh, but but if you've got if you've got something significant and you're just embedding something else into it, and, but what you really have, your IP is really significant and uh, uh, innovative, then there's yeah there's that's absolutely fine. But okay. how, how do you talk about it more offline? Okay. Okay. So for sake of time, I, and we'll send these slides out like we did last week. The, you'll get an email. Uh, shortly afterwards, if not before the end of this, that'll have uh, just a couple of minutes of questions that you have to answer for uh, some feedback on this, and then you'll get a copy of these slides. Okay? And I'm going to skip over um, elevator pitch. These are common, common things for elevator pitch. And let me tell you, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hit on a couple of things that I think are the most important things, some of the most important things for a very successful SBIR that kind of set successful ones apart from ones that don't get funded that I see, okay? And this will take care, and, and this will kind of wrap up the things for, this will cover things for the elevator pitch and the commercial opportunity. I think if you ask me, in my experience over the years, of what probably the one or two things that are the most important, I would say it comes down to how you clearly articulate that there's a need and that, there's a, that you've done customer discovery, okay? 
And how I like to try to do that in a, when writing a proposal, it's right in the very first page, being able to articulate that there's a problem, that it's compelling, okay, and that it's not being addressed by the market, and that don't take your word for it, okay, if that makes sense. And try to capture that in the first half of the page of the proposal. So, uh, to give you a couple of examples, uh, uh, OceanCom, okay, one of the uh, companies here at Research Park, I remember when we, we helped them with their proposal. It happened to be, at the time, they, they do underwater communications, underwater acoustic communications, like think underwater both, okay? So, we tried to figure, uh, uh, where was a real world example where an underwater communication technology could have been useful and needed? And we were able to identify, this happened to be right at the time, if you remember where the, uh, what was it, the, uh, the horizon, the, where there was the, the, uh, the, the Gulf. Yeah, the Gulf, the Gulf Coast. Deep water horizon. Deep water horizon, that's what it was, deep water horizon. That, that had just happened like months before, and there was all that, that catastrophe down in the Gulf. The oil spill, the <coughs> fire burning, and there was actually a report that said if there was an underwater technology that could have allowed them to communicate uh, up top quickly, that could have saved billions of dollars, right? So there was this problem that existed right away, and the, and the gas companies were really looking for a solution, okay? So there was this problem that existed, and there was other problems as well, but that was one that was on people's minds right at the time. Okay, so we were able to come up, we were able to frame the problem, or one of the problems, with this problem that, people, that was on people's minds right away for the gas industry. Okay, so we were able to open with, here's this problem, okay, that, that doesn't have a solution. And we were able to have some quotes from people in the gas and oil industry saying that we're looking for this solution right away. So we were able to say that here's this problem, it's got this real world dollar amount tied to it, and don't take our word for it, here's these people from the gas and oil industry, and we had quotes from them all worked in the first top half of the pair, or top half of the page. That's the type of thing that you try to you want to try to get across in your first page so you captivate the reader, okay? And if you can do that, that goes a long ways to like capturing, getting the people interested in reading the rest of your proposal. Okay? On the other hand, often you'll see proposals where that doesn't happen, right? And you'll see people not mentioning customers that you've actually went out and talked to people. So if you can do that and then capture that in the first half of the page, and then right after that you come in and say, here's how we solve that problem. Okay? And you address that right afterwards. That goes a long ways to uh, making a really uh, compelling proposal. Okay? And that's, the, that's what I would focus on, on your elevator pitch and your uh, commercial opportunity section. Okay, I've written some other bullet points there that are pretty self-explanatory. Uh, I talk about real world examples, I've also mentioned that. Show data, uh, anything you can do to really uh, uh, use real data and be very specific in terms of uh, real numbers. Voice of customer, I mentioned that. Uh, I'll skip over this as well for sake of time. Uh, this stuff's pretty self-explanatory. I've covered most of these things. I'm going to leave uh, the innovations. Roland will cover some of this stuff as well. Uh, one of the questions I'm going to I'm going to bring up a question or something here as well that Roland Roland may address. Uh, I often get questions about IP. Do we need to have a patent or what do we cover in the in that section? Uh, IP is important. Uh, you need to have a, a solid IP plan in your proposal. It always gets discussed. Uh, it's, not a, it's not a deal breaker if you don't have IP, but it, it, it is often brought, brought up in the, the review panel. So you, need, it's not a, you don't have to have patents, but you need to be able to have a, an IP plan in place that you're in the process of, of working on your IP. And you, need, you absolutely have to discuss it, okay? And uh, have a solid plan. So we can help you with that if you're working on it. Okay, I've talked about the team. Make sure you have a solid plan in place for your team. Uh, if you've got <coughs> gaps, address them. Have a, have a solid advisory board in place if you've got some gaps in your team. Uh, that's always important. And let me spend some time here, because I think this is one of the other key things that, uh, in, in addition to the, having a compelling uh, uh, voice of the customer and arti articulating the problem, mm -hmm. one of the other most important things is your letters of support. Okay. Uh, Whatever I review, and I've heard other, many other reviewers talk about this as well, when I get a packet of proposals, the first thing I do is I open right to the letters of support. Okay? I want to see who you got to write letters of support and what they actually committed. Okay? 
Because often you'll get letters of support that say things like, hey, Placid, it was great to see you, that you stopped by my office last week, and uh, it was really interesting hearing your stuff. And that's it. Or you'll see something that says, uh, uh, for venture capitalists, venture capitalists are great ones as well, when they haven't invested in your company. They'll say things like, your stuff was really compelling, I look forward to following you as you uh, move forward. Keep this in mind that when you, you know, keep this in mind in the future. And that's a great one as well. Those are like worthless letters of support. Okay. Um, what are some other good ones? There, there's some that you see every single time. Uh, <coughs> there's one, most of them don't like really commit anything. Then you'll see some that say, this stuff is fantastic and I can't wait to buy it. As soon as it's ready, I'm writing a check. Okay? Or you'll get some that say, you know, I've given you money. Like, I've actually bought this, and it's great. Those are the best. Okay? I always try to, you want to get a letter of support where people actually commit something. If you can't get them to commit money or something, which that's, that's rare, try to get somebody to, try to get the people to commit something. And that can be that they're committing time to help you test something. Okay? that they'll commit resources. That's important. That, that, that's better than nothing, right? And that's actually, that actually means something, if they'll actually commit to help you test something. But my goal in getting, to, getting them to commit is actually get them to commit to, to do something. Here's some other failures. With letters of support, we all know that you're probably going to write your letters of support, and you're going to get somebody to sign it. Yeah, that happens all the time, right? If you do that, Make sure that you don't make them all sound the same. Make sure they don't follow the same format, because often you'll get three letters of support, and you'll look at them as a reviewer, and they'll be the same format, right? It'll start, it'll start, off, or start off by saying, like, you know, we're General Electric. We do this, this, and this. And then it'll have, like, a paragraph of what you're asking for, and then it'll wrap up and, and, and end with the same way. And you'll look at the three letters of support, and they're like, these were clearly written by the same person. Or, if you're not an Anglophone, you may have some weird sentence in there, and it'll be in all three weird letters of support. Like, you'll have some really weird wording, and it'll be in all of the letters of support. Uh, that's another weird one. Just try not to do those. If you're going to have, you may even have different people write the letters of support if you're going to act different people on your team. Ask for one of our communications teams to help you. You can do that, okay? But the key thing, in my opinion, is try to get someone to actually commit something to it, okay? That's important. You can have a technical, I, I try to have, if you can have three letters of, I think phase one now is three letters of support typically. Try to get a commercial, like definitely have a customer write something and back, you know, try to commit or show a commercial potential of it and actually commit something. Try to get a technical letter of support, right? Somebody, uh, uh, committing technically to uh, the what's going on technically in your uh, in your uh, with your innovation that's important and then the third one I just try to I try to get like five letters of support and pick the best three try to get somebody to uh, just like the, the the third one should be something that like backs up your narrative of your proposal and then I also always with your letters of support in my proposal I'll put like a section that talks about the letters of support and why you included them okay and kind of backs up, bolsters your, your letters. But I think letters of support are one of the, uh, the most important parts of the proposal, back up your story. Yeah, Roland. What about letters of support from Research Park? Do they have any value? I think they're better than nothing, but in my opinion, when it comes from your own university, I always think in my mind, so if, okay, if you're lacking a letter of support, get one from Research Park, okay? Rather than turn in less than the number you can do. But in my opinion, I always, in my mind, I'm always just thinking, it comes from the university that they're at. Of course they're going to say good things about it. That's how I always do it. Actually, our letters of support that we provide as Enterprise Works are more nuts and bolts. It's about, it's about the resources that we can provide if the grant is on. But that usually comes in a different section. Those usually go in as the other section, not as a letter of support. But people do submit them from from here's letters of support, and I always, anytime they come from the other university, I always just think in my mind, of course they're going to say nice things. Okay. So, but I would, I would definitely do it rather than not submit one. So, but try to get them from, uh, try to get them from your customers. It's all about customer uh, validation. Good question. 
Any questions about letters of support? Okay, start working on letters of support now because they're harder to get than you think. Another question about the letter of support is if I ask the letter of support from enterprise work, can I correlate this one with the gap that I have, for example, I don't have a business experience, but uh -huh. the support from the enterprise work can address the lack of my business experience? You, you could, but you don't need to do that with a letter of support. You can actually just write in there that you're using the entrepreneurs and residents. And, uh, let me tell you that Enterprise Works and University of Illinois, we have a great reputation with several of the program directors. That, uh, we, we have strong support system here for helping you. And you can, you can include that in your proposal. You don't need a letter of support for that. Yeah, absolutely. So, yes? Use it in your letter of support. So, like, um, these companies, so, like, they conduct sponsored research uh -huh. in my lab, and so they're part of me building this thing that we worked on. So, yeah. would that be, like, an additional support? Like, we've already put money into this, yeah. yes. and we're willing to commit... That, that's good. So I, I look at that and I go, that's a really good, so, so it's, you, you kind of got to, yeah, if they're not getting money in the proposal, then that's fine. I always think when somebody's getting money out of it, they benefit from it, so that's kind of iffy. I see. But if, it, if it's, they have actually, they're committing resources, that's a very strong letter of support. Okay? Good. Any other questions? <clears throat> If not, I'll spend the last the last ten minutes talking about the the review process. Actually, there's one other area that might be handy for you to discuss, just because it comes up all the time, and that's conflicts of interest. Mm -hmm. We typically have professors whose grad students are running a company. The company has an SBR proposal. They subcontract to the University of Illinois, whose owner of the company, being the faculty member, is also the lead PI on the university. So there's you know, potential conflict of interest. There are mechanisms to handle that, but I wonder if you. That comes up enough, maybe you could mention it. Yeah, so so you just need to make sure if you're let, let me let me just address it this way. Okay. If you're a faculty member and you're doing anything with an SBIR at the university, make sure you go talk to Melanie Lutz on campus, make sure you fill out all that paperwork and because uh, you've got to be very careful with that. Okay? So if you haven't done that, make sure you do that. And uh, we can talk about that at a different time. Because there's a lot of nuanced details there, but uh, yeah, just make sure you do that and uh, and, and she'll help you lay out a plan in that. She's on your side. She's uh, she'll help you make sure you, you cover all your dot all your eyes, cross all your t's. So uh, let's let me let me just show this right here. This is a picture of what an SBIR proposal looks like. This is just one I, I pulled out there. They're all similar, uh, but that's just that's just an idea of what one could look like. Okay, they don't have to look exactly like that, but it's just roughly what one looks like. The only reason I show that is because I mentioned this last time. I, I've seen a couple that came in that looked vastly different, that didn't look anything like this, and they got deemed because they didn't look like an SBIR proposal. And uh, somebody got sent, there was one that went in for I Corps that got sent back and said, that doesn't look like an, SBI, an NSF proposal. So, uh, this is not an NSF proposal because it has half inch margins, by the way. It must be an NIH proposal. No, this was an NSF. With half inch margins? Yeah, this was fine. They're not the sticklers they used to be rolling. Wow. Okay, all right. Yes. <laughs> the ones that didn't look like um, SBIR proposals, was it that they used a funky outline or they got too frilly in their design or what was? No, they were, well, first of all, they were like a mom and pop shop. Okay. Like they were not academics. Ah. They were, and so it looked nothing like a, like it looked like like my, my parents sitting down and typing something on a typewriter. Uh-huh, okay. And so it just didn't look like an academic proposal. So I think anybody that's ever written an academic proposal would put together something that looked, kind of like looked yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I think it had like, it was like triple spaced or something and it just looked really <laughs> weird. Lots of pictures and, uh, but it did not look in crayon, it was written in crayon. <laughs> but no, if any, anybody that's put together an academic proposal would, would be fine. And my experience has been with the NSF program, if you're submitting an NSF proposal, if you're an NSF, like the NSF program directors want to help you, I, I, have not, I have not seen them reject something because it didn't have like half inch margins. I know in the past it used to feel like that. Yeah, it was always that way. But my experience is not like that anymore. The, the it used to have program. something in Vaseline which would automatically... Yeah, the Vaseline verification machinery would kick yeah. out. I do not think, I have not, that has not been my experience anymore. Because huh. yeah. those ones, like I told you, the, what, the bad ones, they don't, like, they made it through because they were in the panels I've been on. There's a fast lane when, when you generate a proposal in fast lane, 
doesn't meet some of it was yeah. Yeah. yeah, I seem to remember ten, ten years ago as a pattern inside it did that. I don't think it does it anymore. Okay. So <laughs> is this so I mean I ask this because like for example letter of support. Mm -hmm. So if, when you typically do an NSF uh, proposal and you do the letter of commitments, if they tell you they need to look exactly the same, like it needs to have this like sentences and whatnot. And clearly this is something very different. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. No. Is this whole like submission process just different than when you're submitting to NSF for I so yeah I don't know I don't think it's it's not that okay. specific absolutely um, but it's so there's very specific things you do have to submit right it'll tell you you have to submit like the facilities document okay. and the uh, yeah the data the data plan it tells you very specific documents but not it has to say this 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 and this okay and let me just be clear too you have to submit on time if you are Two seconds after the deadline, you're you're done, and I've I've never seen them be lenient on that either. So, okay, so let me tell you uh, briefly about the review process. I've talked, I, I've mentioned a few things about this already. Uh, the is a reviewer. You get the proposals right before you know a week or two before the deadline. And you review them. Uh, you and then you show up at the you show up at the NSF the, the day of the proposal in the morning. You've got usually three to four technical reviewers, three to four uh, commercial reviewers. You show up with your notes and then you sit down and you typically spend 30 to 40 minutes talking about each proposal. And everybody has come in with uh, with their feedback about each proposal. And then you spend time discussing each one, discuss the merits of it. Usually there's a, a technical commercial reviewer assigned as leads to each proposal. And then you sit down and you have a discussion about each one. And you see the criteria online, right? They give you the, the, the criteria that you use for each one of the proposals. And then after you have that discussion, every proposal is given, um, where did I have this at? I have this somewhere. Each proposal is given, um, I'm sorry, I don't know where I have that at. Each proposal is given, a, they, they, they always draw on the chalkboard three, uh, two lines down the middle, and so you've got three sections, right? And each proposal is put in, put in a, either a fund, fund if possible, and do not fund bucket. Okay? And sometimes they're put on the line in between those buckets. <coughs> that was one of your first ones. Yeah, that was one of my first, first ones. Because yeah. Yeah. I wondered what those letters were for. Yeah, yeah so it's fund, do not fund, okay. fund if possible. Okay? I always think about it as like, the, like a stoplight, right? You've got green, yellow, and red. And you're, you get put in one of those buckets. And you do that after you, you do that at the end of the at the end of the, the panel, and then you kind of you, you do some trading back and forth. Well, where do you think this one goes? Where do you think this one goes? And the thing is, is you just my my, my thought process is always been you don't want to end up very few end up in the fun, right? Only sometimes I've been on panels where no one ends up in the fun. Most everybody ends up in the fun if possible, and then uh, there's there's always several that end up in the do not fun. And the, uh, that's, that's what happens. Some end up on the line, and then they kind of rank them in that panel, and then that's it, and you're done, and then you'll leave. I always think about my mind, your goal is to write that proposal that ends up in the, the funded possible or the, the fund bucket. Now, I'll tell you what I've heard several times is that you hear the program, I've heard program directors say over the years several times is it's hard for the program director to fund something that's in the do not fund. Okay? So that's an interesting thing to hear. They can fund, the program directors can fund anything. It's just it's hard for them to fund the do, if something that's in do not fund. Or it's hard for them not to fund something if it's in the fund. So I was just thinking about you want to make sure you write that proposal that's in the, that doesn't end up in a do not fund bucket. Okay. So my experience has been if we, you know, here at, at University of Illinois, if you've got a good solid technology, and you write a solid proposal and just you know address the needs and the the uh, address the questions that are in the proposal. You do good solid customer discovery. The you've got a really good chance of ending up in that fund if possible bucket. Okay, and if you work with our resources that we have here, we've got a really a, a really high success rate of getting uh, funded here. So then after the after the panel, then we leave and the. As a panel reviewer, you don't care what happens after that unless like, you track the companies yourself. But um, the questions happen outside of the reviewers after that. It's pretty straightforward. But uh, it's, it's an interesting process. But 
Uh, pretty straightforward. Yeah. Do like, the directors ever talk to you individually, or is it totally separate? Good question. You, meaning you, the you, the so the person that submits yeah. the proposal. Yes. Yeah, so this this happens on a day, usually a couple of months after. If things are going well, you'll get some questions from the program director. Okay, and that's a good sign, right? If you don't hear anything, that's not a good sign. Uh, but usually in a couple of months you'll get some questions back and they'll ask, they'll, usually everybody gets questions. And they'll, they'll ask some, uh, just some follow-up questions from the panel. And if, you're, if it's going really well, they're really easy questions, right? That takes you like five minutes to answer. Uh, but if you get some questions, that's a good sign. And then they'll, sometimes they'll ask some budget questions as well. And uh, think about it like this too. If, it goes, if, if you get funded, the money will be in your bank six months after you go through the panel. But usually within yes. two to three months, you'll start getting the questions. Uh, yes? Chip, um, let me see Lavender again. So uh, we were in contact with the program officer that seemed to make sense for us, and she encouraged us to do an online pre-submission, which we did. And then, of course, I sent it to her because our consultant said she never had a client where they actually got back to her. What do you know about that process? And are we talking NSF? Yes, NSF. Yes, yeah, yeah, so... Uh, Usually is what happens is they always tell you to submit or to reach out to the program director first, right, before the proposal. And the, my experience has been it depends on the program director. Like sometimes, and it also depends on when you send it to them, right? Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't uh, when you, get, when you uh, reach out to them. And I always say do it, and uh, it doesn't hurt to do it, but uh, don't count on a response from them. But absolutely uh, submit. I think I think they even tell you to do it now. But the, there's a link that tells you to mm -hmm. submit uh, to submit uh, the one pager to them. But uh, the big thing is just get it in. You know, try to get feedback from them. They rarely will tell you don't submit. Like I don't know if I've ever heard them tell you it's a waste of time. But you should always reach out to them and submit your submit your stuff to them beforehand. But the the other the other key thing that you absolutely have to do. We we hit on this a couple weeks ago. Go to, the, go to their home page uh, and, and start the steps of getting ready to submit your proposal with the, uh, the uh, SAMS database, the DUNS number, and uh, what's the third one, Roland? There's three of them. Well, there's an SBIR database, an SBIR registry. Yeah, yeah there's three, then Fastlane. Fastlane, of course. Start getting those set up now because it takes three to four weeks to get those done. Usually, I'll just be honest, usually it's quicker than that, but you have to leave that much time because every once in a while they'll have a problem and it, it'll take that long. And if you wait and you're not ready, you're not registered with one of those databases, you'll go and you wait till the last minute, you'll go to submit your proposal and you will not be able to submit. Okay? So make sure you go start on that now. So Jeff, help us understand a little bit about the benefits or the value of reaching out to them ahead of time if we might not hear back from them. Is it because we might hear back and you want to have some advice? Yes, that's... Or it puts top of mind awareness for them that they it's a good question so let me, sort of like early advertising for lack of a better way to put it so so the question was why what's the value of reaching out beforehand i'll tell you why the value why in my opinion you reach out beforehand okay so go back to that part where i said you get dropped in that do not fund fund or fund if possible okay uh, i like where the, so the program i've heard from several program directors that it's hard for them to fund something that's in the do not fund okay right it's hard for them to fund something that's do not fund it doesn't mean they cannot fund it if it's in do not fund. Now, I hear that, and I, it tells me that they can fund whatever they want to fund, right? They can, if it's in do not fund, they can fund it. It's just hard for them to fund it, right? It all goes back to the program director. My experience has been at NSF as well. If you're in, if you're at NSF and SBIR program, any question you ask, like I've been to those grantees conference, and it's like the answer to every question is talk to your program director. <laughs> The, that is like the answer to everything. It's get approval from your program director. They can do everything. So my, my, my process has always been, if you can gain the trust of your program director, you, it's just smooth sailing with, with SBIR program. So anything you can do to engender trust in your program director, it's that, I, I just do it. And so reaching out to them is a good thing. Okay? That, that's, that's how I've always just approached SBIR. Just, Show your program director that you're you're a competent company. So also, that's why I'm filling out the form is a good exercise. The questions yeah. that they ask you are oh, the same yeah. kinds of questions you'll have to do in the proposal, okay. so you don't waste any time Practice. thinking through those forms. It's it's good to do for your own yeah. benefit. Yep.
That's exactly right. So I get, I get that process, and then once you're funded by them, you know, keep your program director up to date. Think of them as a team member, but don't ask them questions all the time, right? Because then that shows you're not competent, right? But just keep them in the loop and think of them as a team member, because they're fantastic to work with. All right, yes? This might be a bad question, but uh, does the money get taxed that you receive from that? Roland, that's a budget question. Yes, well, the, the money doesn't get taxed. You get taxed on profit. Mm -hmm. okay. And so if you accept more money from a grant fund than you expend in grant resources, the difference profit is what you get um, taxed on. If you spend more, because you put in your own money or something, if you spend more money than you actually receive in income, then you can show a loss as a result. Okay. Now, I won't get into the details here, but you have to be careful about how much money you take out. If you get funded late in the fiscal year, September or something, you're allowed to take out you know, a whole, whatever your advance amount is. You can take out a huge amount of money and you only have three months to spend against it. And at the end of the year, it looks like you've got this huge amount of income and a very small amount of profit. And so there are ways to deal with that at an accounting level. I won't talk about them now, but it's easier if you're careful initially to take out only as much as you're going to need that year. Because they, they let you do that. They, they make the money available at ACMS, and they say, okay, you can now take out $200,000. How much do you want? And you think, why wouldn't I take out $200,000? Well, the answer is because if you take out the $200,000, and it's late in the year, and you only spend $100,000, you looks like you got $100,000 worth of profit. Taxable profit. So talk to your accountant. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So with that, we are out of time. So if you have any other questions, reach out to us, and we'll get... We'll send out an email today, so please respond to the email and, and give us feedback. It'll only take a couple minutes, then you'll get a copy of the slides. And then we have your email address. We will also send it out because we're going to get Jesus scheduled in the next week or so. He apologized. Uh, again, family emergency uh, last night, and we'll get it scheduled. All right, thanks.